few seconds here. So I'm going to make this announcement as you, people are coming in. Uh, everybody will need a Bible. Uh, at, in about 45 minutes into this, he's going to have you use your Bible. He, he doesn't want you to share. He wants you to be able to have one. So if you have access to it on your phone, if not, uh, our student staff will go grab a couple of Bibles out of the student building. We'll kind of put them on the banisters on the balcony, and you guys can grab one uh, here in a minute. Uh, but we want to make sure that everybody has, a, um, has access to a Bible because he's going to need that. Well, it's a privilege to have uh, Dr. Whitney back with us this afternoon to lead this Praying the Bible. I know there'll be those of you that are joining us online and there'll be other people coming into the room here. Uh, I think you guys will be in uh, for an incredible afternoon. And then we look forward to him being with our high school and middle school parents this evening talking about family worship. So you guys can welcome Dr. Whitney to the stage. Thank you. Now, is this, can you hear me? This is on? Okay, I wasn't sure, didn't remember turning that on. Great. Well, it's a, a delight to be back. Thank you for coming back. I know for some of you it's, it's quite a sacrifice. I'm grateful uh, for those who are going to be watching, um, watching online. Um, I'm going to do this a little more quickly than I, I normally do, but we'll try to um, make the most of it, so I'll do a little bit of uh, editing on the fly. When it comes to the two most important personal spiritual disciplines, the intake of the Word of God in prayer, I believe there's an almost universal problem with both. And the problem with the intake of the word looks like this. And, and this is true even among our most devoted daily Bible readers. They take their Bible, they read a chapter, maybe they read two chapters, three chapters, ten chapters. And they close their Bible, and most days... As soon as they close their Bible, if pressed, they would have to admit what? Yeah, everybody can hear said it. I forget it, don't remember a thing I read. And everybody's, yeah, this, it's almost universal. And we tend to conclude, well, I guess it's just me. There's something wrong with me. I, I'm just a second-rate Christian. I never had a good memory. I'm losing what memory I did have. I uh, never had a high IQ, never had a great education. And so somehow or another, the problem is me. Well, all those things may be true about you, but that's not why you don't remember what you read in the Bible. The problem is almost certainly not you, it's your method. And there's a simple, permanent, biblical method by which you, you don't forget what you read in the Bible. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Maybe I can come back sometime and talk about that. That's the most important personal spiritual discipline because the intake of the word is, is primary. It's more important for us to hear from God through his word than for God to hear from us in prayer. So the intake of the word is primary, but there's an almost universal problem. With prayer, there is also an almost universal problem. And it looks like this, that when we do pray, we tend to say the same old things about what? The same old things. That's right. And when you've said the same old things about the same old things about a thousand times, how do you feel about saying them again? You don't? <laughs> Who else? Anybody dare use the B word? Yes, boring. I think it takes courage to admit that. We can be talking to the most fascinating person in a universe about the most important things in our lives and be bored to death. Not because we don't love God, not because we don't love who or what we're praying about. I would contend that if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, the problem in prayer is almost certainly not you, rather it is your method. Now, I made that very important caveat. I said, if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, I believe the biggest problem in evangelicalism and probably Southern Baptist life as well is the church member without the Holy Spirit the unconverted 
church member. By our own self-reported statistics, self-counted, self-reported statistics, two-thirds of Southern Baptist church members aren't in church in, in pre-COVID times, giving reason to at least question their salvation. Right? Not only the Lord knows, but the Lord himself has told us, by this we know we've passed out of darkness into light because we love the brothers. And if they don't love us enough to ever be with us, in person, online, anything, if they don't love us enough to ever be with us, that's reason to at least question that love, don't you think? If you don't think so, try that on your spouse. I love you. I don't care if I ever see you again, but I really love you. Well, they would at least question your love, right? But let me presume to be speaking to people who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, anyone who would turn out or tune in on a Sunday afternoon. Um, let me presume that you, you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but the ways you know that you are among them are you have holy hungers. You didn't have for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You hunger for the Holy Word of God you used to find boring or, or irrelevant. You hunger for fellowship with God's people, not just socializing. That's talking about news, weather, sports, work, family, politics. Now, it's good, healthy, and normal to talk about those things, but unbelievers do that. But I prefer, this is one of the cases I prefer to use the Greek word. Most of you have heard of it before, koinonia, the word translated fellowship, because when I say the word fellowship, I think what, what most of us hear we could be pictured more as socializing. But koinonia is talking about God and the things of God. And who, those who are indwelled by the Spirit of God crave to talk about God and the things of God. That's one of the reasons you, you love the brothers. You want to be with them. You, you, you love hearing testimonies of answered prayer. You love hearing testimonies of how people came to Christ. You love hearing testimonies of people having opportunities to share the gospel. You love hearing, hearing testimonies of God at work. And you love to be with the people of God, to talk about the things of God. That's, that's why you can't stay away. You cannot imagine life apart from the people of God. You can't wait to come back together in person. So when you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you have, you have a supernatural craving for that. The world does not have. When you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, well, just remember, you have two people living in your body. The Holy Spirit, who is a person, and, and you. And unlike 40% of Southern Baptists, apparently according to one Lifeway survey, who, be, who believe the Holy Spirit is a force, he is a person. He's the third member of the triune Godhead. And when another person, and if you're an expectant mom here today, by the way, that means three people live in your body. But a believer in Christ has two people living in your body, and that other person is not passive. Just like an expectant mom, you realize, boy, something's different. And, and then it dawns upon you sooner or later that I've got another person living in my body. And then it, pretty soon it's evident to everybody there's another person living in your body. That's the way it is with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You realize something's different within you. And sooner or later, other people can see there's something different. And when the Holy Spirit indwells you, he brings his holy nature with him. When you came in through those doors a few minutes ago, you didn't pause at the door and say, hmm, which nature am I going to bring in with me today? Maybe I'll bring in my alligator nature. No, none of you thought that because you don't have an alligator nature. You have only a human nature, and you bring your human nature with you wherever you go. Where, well, wherever the Holy Spirit goes, he brings his holy nature with him. And when he indwells any flesh and blood creature... You have those new holy hungers you didn't have before, those new holy longings you didn't have before. You long to live in a body without sin anymore. You long to live with a holy mind, no longer attracted to temptation and sin ever again. You long to live in a holy and perfect world where there's no more racism, there's no more terrorism, there's no more traffic jams. There's no more frustrations. There's no more masks to wear. Hallelujah. There's no more COVID. 
And you long to live in that holy and perfect world with holy and perfect people. What Jonathan Edwards called a world of love. And you long at last to see face to face when the angels call holy, holy, holy. And that's the heartbeat of all those in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. These are ways you know that another person is dwelling within you, a person who is not passive, giving you holy hungers, holy appetites, holy longings, holy aspirations. And one of the things the Bible says the Holy Spirit does in all those in whom he dwells is that he causes us. We don't merely choose this. He causes us to cry out, what? Abba, Father. We have this new heavenward orientation, this fatherward orientation. Abba, Father, when you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. In other words, all those indwelled by the Holy Spirit really want to pray. <clears throat> and yet, while that impulse is pressing against one side of your body, of your soul, so to speak, colliding with that is your experience. So within you is this thing going on that says, I believe in prayer. I want to pray. I try to pray, but frankly, when I pray, it's boring. I know it shouldn't be that way. I don't want it to be that way, but it is that way, so I guess it's just me. I'm just a second-rate Christian. No, if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, the problem is almost certainly not you. Rather, it is your method. And the method of most Christians, almost from the beginning of their Christian life, is to say the same old things about the same old things. Now, the problem is not that we pray about the same old things. <clears throat> In fact, I would contend that to pray about the same old things is normal. If I sent you out right now and I just said, scatter around this, this building and I, I want you to pray for 10 minutes and I didn't give you any instructions when we came back together, I'm confident you all would have prayed pretty much about the same six things. You'd pray about your family in some broad general sense or another. Spouse, child, parent, grandparent, sibling, singles might pray to be married, have family. But it would almost certainly be somehow a family-related prayer. You'd pray about your future and some decision that's before you. Should you make that job change or should you not? Should you make that move? should you not something about your future you'd pray about your finances God's provision for those bills for that car for school you'd pray about your work or students would pray about their schoolwork and that makes sense that you'd spend time praying about that place where you spend most of your waking hours during the week you'd pray certainly about your church a ministry that you have some Christian concern that you have maybe someone you're trying to share the gospel with down the street or at work and then you'd pray about the current crisis in your life statistically I'm told each of us goes through a pretty significant life crisis on the average of every six months or so now it can be a good thing or a bad thing it can be a birth or a death it can be a job change you want or, or one you don't want but it's on the order of magnitude so that when you go to pray it's one of the first things that pops into your head you don't need any prayer list to remember to pray about this thing well if these six things dominate your prayer life cheer up you're normal because if you're going to pray about your life this is your life isn't it if you don't think so how much of your life has no connection whatsoever to your family your future your finances your work or school work church ministry Christian concern or the current crisis that's your life right and thank the Lord, these things don't change dramatically very often, do they? Well, put all that together. If you're going to pray about your life on a given day, and these six things are your life, and these six things don't change dramatically very often, that means you're going to pray about the same old things most of the time. See that? That's normal. That's not the problem. The problem is we tend to say the same old things about the same old things. And that's boring. When prayer is boring, you don't feel like praying, do you? You don't feel like praying because you're going to say the same old things about the same old things. You know in advance it's going to be boring. 
When you know in advance something's going to be boring, you don't get excited about it, do you? It's like you don't have to, you know, your kids don't come home saying, Mom, hurry up with supper. I can't wait to get to my math homework. In fact, just forget supper. Forget dessert. I just can't wait. I want to get on it right now. No, you have to make them do it. Why? Because they say it's boring. When you know in advance something's going to be boring, you don't get excited about it, right? When you know in advance prayer is going to be boring, you don't feel like doing it, do you? And when you don't feel like praying, you know what you tend not to do? To pray. Oh, you may grind it out for five to seven minutes, but five to seven minutes feels like an eternity. And your mind is wandering most of that five to seven minutes. And you'll come to yourself and say, now, wait a minute, where was I? I haven't been thinking of God for the last several minutes. And you'll come back to that mental script in your head that you've repeated so many times, and you'll pick it up again, and you'll start on from there. But because you have said it so many times, your mind almost immediately begins to wander in another direction. And we feel like failures. And all we can conclude is, I guess it's just me. I am a second-rate Christian. I don't want it to be that way, but it's always been that way. No matter what I do, it ends up that way. I read books on prayer, go to conferences on prayer, hear sermons on prayer. I go back to prayer, remotivated, revitalized. Well, it's, it's pretty much saying the same old things about the same old things with just a little more oomph behind it for a while. But pretty soon that evaporates away, and here we are again back where we were before, only now feeling more guilty than ever because we'd gone back to prayer so remotivated, so revitalized. All we're left to conclude is there's just something wrong with me. I'm a second-rate Christian. I believe that feeling is almost universal. And before very long, it's easy to become like that little girl he used to go to bed every night <clears throat> repeating that same old sweet colonial memorized prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one night she thought to herself, why does God need to hear me say this again? So one night she just recorded it into her phone, and thereafter she just played the recording to God every night from her phone. Now some of you are laughing, but you have prayer recordings in your heads. They're just a little more sophisticated than that. I dare say that in most of your background, your family background, church experience somewhere in the past, there are people that when they're called on to pray, you could give their prayer. You have heard it so many times, right? If they're called on to close Bible study, they stand up or called to pray some of the time, they stand up, begin to pray, and they drop dead in the middle of their prayer, eight other people could stand up and finish <laughs> their prayer. I'm in a different church almost every Sunday. Well, sir, I was before, before the COVID. And I hear the same prayers all over America. Lead, guide, and direct us. Bless the gift and the giver. Hide the pastor behind the shadow of the cross. I mean, like beads on a string. The red bead, and then here's a green bead. The blue bead will be next. Yep, there it is. I knew it. Now, maybe, maybe it's totally different in Oklahoma City. I don't know. Maybe it's the green bead, then the blue bead. Then there are, it's the same prayers all the time, all over the place. I told you uh, that I've pastored about 15 years for a, a church in the suburbs of Chicago. One Sunday morning, the ushers came for the offering, and one of the ushers prayed before the offering. And as he prayed, I could hear someone else talking. I thought, well, surely this person will be quiet in just a moment. But as it continued, I realized it was a child. I thought, well, surely some adult's going to get this child in line in just a minute here. But it continued. So I was sitting on the platform and opened my eyes and looked, and there on the second pew was the five-year-old son of the usher who was praying. And what do you think that little boy was saying? Exactly what his daddy was praying. Not repeating it after him. It was in unison with him. Like we'll say the Lord's Prayer in unison sometimes, only this was Dad's prayer. They were saying together word for word. Now, how could he do that? It's because every time Dad prayed, whether it was over the supper table at home or the Lord's supper table at church, it was the same old prayer every single time. 
This kid has only been in the world 60 months, and he's already memorized everything his dad prays when he prays. Just like you've memorized the prayers of other people, and they've memorized yours. And it's bloodless, and it's heartless, and it's lifeless. And we know it shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. It's always been that way. That's the way we've learned how to pray, and so we just soldier on. Bored, heartless, grieved over our prayer life. We don't know what else to do. Well, what's the solution? Well, whatever it is, I would argue it must be fundamentally simple. Why? Why? Why must the solution be simple? You know. Huh? Yeah, if it's hard, we won't do it. And who, who's we, by the way? You're right. Come on. Who's we? Church where? All over. All right. God has people all over the world, doesn't he? From 9 to 99. Low IQs, high IQs. Very little education. A great deal of education. Very few Christian privileges. I was on a mission trip once to the bush country of Kenya. Not even the pastor had a Bible. And then there are people like every person in this room and every person watching me who have many Christian privileges. You go to a church where the Bible is preached. If you haven't had to look for a church in a while, you may not realize even in a city this big how difficult it might be to find a church where the Bible is actually preached. You have access to to Christian books. I mean, right here in your church building to buy or borrow and someone who didn't have that, that they have Christian bookstores they can go to. And if someone didn't have access to that, if they can get online, they can have almost any Christian book they want tomorrow if they pay overnight shipping. If they have an iPad or a Kindle, something like that, they can have almost any Christian book they want in their hands in 30 seconds. And you've got Christian radio stations you can listen to. And a lot of things on there maybe you shouldn't listen to, but you've got you know, men like an Alistair Begg and a John MacArthur preaching the Bible on Christian radio. If a person didn't live near a Christian radio station, if they can get on the Internet, they can hear the best Bible preaching and teaching in the world 24-7, even by guys who are dead. And all of those Christian advantages are available to every person in this room and every person watching this. And so if you... And I mean every born-again person listening to me right now, every spirit-indwelled person, if you, with all these Christian advantages, if you can't have a meaningful, satisfying prayer life, then what about our brothers and sisters in the middle of India, in the middle of China, who have none of your Christian advantages? Are you prepared to say they can't have a meaningful, satisfying prayer life because they don't have your Christian advantages? No, none of you would say that. None of you would say, well, Whitney, that, I, that's pretty tight logic, I guess. If, if I, with all my Christian advantages, if I can't have a meaningful, satisfying prayer life, and frankly, I don't, well, then pff, that rules out just about every Christian in the world. Because very, a very small percentage of Christians in the world would have your Christian advantages. None of you believes that. So what is the simple, biblical, permanent solution to this almost universal problem? Well, here it is. When you pray, pray the Bible. Now, I don't think I heard anyone go, oh, and that's good. That's actually very good. If you'd never heard of anything like this before, I think you'd have reason to be suspicious. It's not the job of any Bible teacher to come up with something novel, creative, brand new. Our job is to preach the faith once delivered to all the saints. But I do think it's something that's often been neglected. Now, where most of us have heard something like this most often has been when we've gone through teaching on the apostles' Uh, on the epistles of Paul. And we come to those prayers in the letters of Paul, like at the end of Ephesians 1 or at the end of Ephesians 3. 
And we study those prayers and we say, you know what? Uh, we ought to pray those prayers today. And we should. But I want to contend we can not only pray the prayers in Ephesians, we can pray the whole letter of Ephesians. But I think the easiest place to do this is in the book of Psalms. So turn with me to the very famous 23rd Psalm and let me illustrate from a passage you all know what it would look like to pray through the 23rd Psalm. So you've already done your daily Bible reading, meditation on Scripture, and you say to yourself, you know, now I'm going to pray. And I think I'll pray using that method I learned at the conference at church about praying the Bible. I'm going to pray a psalm. I think I'll pray the 23rd psalm. It might look something like this. You read, the Lord is my shepherd, and you pray, Lord, thank you, you are my shepherd. You're a good shepherd, and you've shepherded me all my life. But, oh, good shepherd, would you shepherd me in this decision I have to make about my future? Do I make that job change or do I not? Do I make that move or do I not? Lord, shepherd me. And, Lord, would you shepherd my family today? Guide them into the ways of God. Guard them from the ways of the world. Lead them not into temptation. Deliver them from evil. And, oh, Lord, I pray you'd make my family your sheep too. Cause them to love you as their shepherd, as I love you as my shepherd. And would you shepherd our under-shepherds at the church? Please shepherd them as they shepherd us. Basically, whatever comes to mind as you read the Lord is my shepherd, that's what you pray. And then when nothing else comes to mind, you go to the next line. I shall not want. Lord, I thank you that I've never really been in want. I haven't missed many meals. All that I have, all that I am is from you, Lord. But I, I know it pleases you that I bring my desires to you. So would you provide those finances that we need for those, car, for those bills, for that car, for school? Or you know someone who is in want. Maybe you think of friends or people you know of down where the hurricane has hit. Or you know someone who is in want, and you pray God's provision for them. Then, when you can't think of anything else to say, you go on. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And frankly, what comes to mind is, Lord, I pray somehow you'd enable me to lie down and take a nap today. Or the idea of the green pastures reminds you of the feeding of God's flock in the green pastures of his word. And so, you think of a, a ministry you're involved with, of feeding God's flock in the green pastures of his word, or someone who feeds your soul. When's the last time you prayed for your Bible study teacher? Have you ever done that? The one who feeds your soul. Now, when I mentioned... makes me lie down in green pastures and what comes to mind is lying down and taking a nap hold, hold on to that I'm going to come back to that one of the most important classes we have in the seminary is called hermeneutics it's about interpreting the Bible correctly and we never have a right to read into the Bible what we want to read there our job is to dig out what the Bible says but just hang on to that I'm going to come back in just a moment so maybe at this point your mind begins to wonder because of weariness or you hear a noise outside or your phone dings or for whatever reason you get distracted well now you've got something to come back to the the very next line he restores or excuse me he leads me beside still waters oh lord you might pray lead me in this decision about my future i want to do what you want me to do lord i'm just not sure what that is lead me lord and lead me beside still waters quiet the anxious waters in my heart quiet the waters at work or wherever waters need to be made quiet Quiet the waters in our home. Then when you can't think of anything else, you go on. He restores my soul. Oh, Lord, you might pray. I come to you so spiritually dry today. Please restore to me the joy of your salvation. 
Or maybe you think of that person down the street you're trying to share the gospel with. You pray God would restore their soul from darkness to light, from death to life. And on and on you would go through this passage, simply talking to God about whatever comes to mind as you go through it line by line. When nothing comes to mind, you go on to the next verse. If you don't understand the next verse, you go on to the next verse. If you understand the next verse perfectly, it just doesn't prompt anything to pray about, fine, skip it, go on to the next verse. There's nothing that says you have to pray over every verse. You're going to come across verses you don't understand. You're going to come across verses you just, they, they don't prompt anything to pray about, fine, just keep going. You really can't mess it up. Just talk to God about whatever comes to mind. Now let's come back to that idea of rightly interpreting the scripture in just about every other kind of coming to the bible i can think of reading it trying to understand the meaning for purposes of application or teaching to other people just about every other time i can think of coming to the bible our main priority is what does it say what does it mean what do the words actually say and then what what's the proper interpretation what does that mean we never have a right to read into it what we want. And where you see this actually experienced so often in a church is when you've got a Bible study group and someone says, what does this verse mean to you? What does this verse mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Well, frankly, it doesn't matter what it means to you. What matters is what it means to God, what God means in those words. That's the most important thing. That's our job. We don't bring meaning to it. Our job is to dig out the meaning he's put there in the beginning. And yeah, you can get that wrong. If I were, had been preaching this morning on Psalm 23 and got to verse 3 and it said, He restores my soul. And I said, folks, that verse is about evangelism. That's about God restoring the souls of lost people from darkness to light, from death to life. It would have been sin if I said that. Because that, that's not what that verse means. And I know it. And yet I think it is good and right to pray, Lord, restore the souls of my lost neighbors from darkness to light, from death to life. Because we're not, what, we're not interpreting the Bible here. This is not Bible study. What we're doing here, our primary activity is what? Prayer. And what I'm suggesting is as you're praying through, glance at the text and talk to God about whatever comes to mind, even if, now listen carefully because this is the most potentially misunderstandable thing I will say. When I say pray about whatever comes to mind, even if what comes to mind has nothing to do with the text. Now let me defend that statement from the text of Scripture. What does the text of Scripture tell us to pray about? Everything, right? The Bible wants us to pray about everything. So everything that comes to mind as you're looking at the Bible is something you ought to pray about anyway, right? Let me push it to an extreme here. Suppose you're in that psalm that says, Oh, Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who could stand? And your friend, Mark, comes to mind. What should you do? Pray for Mark. You know that verse isn't about Mark. It was written 3,000 years before Mark was born. Besides, your friend Mark is a noun. That's a verb. Pray for Mark. It doesn't matter what prompts it, right? It doesn't matter where the prompt comes from. Pray for Mark. And so that's why I say whatever comes to mind as you're going through the text, talk to God about it even if it has nothing to do with the text. Because frankly, I have enough confidence in the Word and in the Spirit that if people pray like this, their prayers are going to be far more biblical than they ever would be making up their own prayers. And that's what people tend to do. It's not going to be some un unconnected thing like marking iniquities and your friend Mark. It's not going to be that diverged, divergent mo more, uh, very often. But if it does, you ought to pray for Mark anyway. So I'm not saying look for the strangest thing you can think of. I'm just saying whatever comes to mind, talk to God about it. And if nothing comes to mind, go on until something does come to mind. So that's why I say you, you really can't mess it up. 
You just go through it line by line, talking to God about whatever comes to mind. Nothing says you have to pray over every verse. Nothing says you have to finish the psalm. I was doing this once in Santa Rosa, California, and gave people a chance to try it. One woman prayed 25 minutes, and she never got past, The Lord is my shepherd. 25 minutes, five words. Now, do you really think the Lord is up there going, You didn't finish that psalm? No, I think he was delighted she could talk to him for 25 minutes about being her shepherd, don't you? But the very next day, she may have been back in Psalm 22 with 31 verses, and in 31 verses, maybe only half a dozen things came to mind. Fine, turn the page. You really can't mess it up. You don't have to pray over every verse. You don't have to finish the psalm. Once during the semester, I require my students to spend four consecutive hours alone with God. And the first day of class, when I mention that, you should see them go, what am I going to do for four hours? But after I've taught this and taught about meditation on Scripture, most of them spend the entire four hours alternating between those two. And having done this with thousands of students, when they write about their experience, nearly all of them report that they spent more than four hours. Not because they had to. They were enjoying it so much, they didn't want to stop. See, all you have to do is just keep turning the page, and you never run out of anything to say. But best of all, let's circle back to where we started. That prayer is unlike any prayer you've ever prayed in your life. Pray the Bible, and you never again say the same old things about the same old things. You see that? You're delivered from that. You never again say the same old things about the same old things, but you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to look at any notes. You just open your Bible, and you just go through it line by line, talking to God about whatever comes to mind. And every day, it's going to be a different prayer than any other day. Now, most days, the time available to us for prayer is closer to four minutes than four hours, isn't it? But this still works. You just don't get as far. <laughs> Maybe you started out, I'm going to pray for four hours today and just keep turning the pages of the Psalms. And after four minutes, an emergency happens and you're gone. But the first four minutes would look exactly the same whether you ended at four minutes or whether you're going to pray for four hours and continue on for four hours. You just go through it line by line. So this method expands or contracts to however much or however little time you have to pray. That's why I say it's just so easy. You really can't mess it up. You go through it line by line, talking to God about whatever comes to mind. And if anyone is fearful that, well, if you do that, somebody may come up with some weird interpretation and infect the whole church with it. Well, number one, I've never known that to happen. Two, I'll acknowledge it could happen. But three, if it did happen, then Paul says to Timothy, it's the job of the pastoral leadership to gently correct such a person. But I can tell you, after 24 years in pastoral ministry, I'd much rather have that job than have the job of trying to get someone to pray who's not praying. God willing, tomorrow morning I'm going to be on a Delta jet heading down the runway to your airport. That big bird's going to rumble and finally lift up into the air. And if halfway to Atlanta, the winds blew us off course, all it takes to get back on course is this. <laughs> I'd much rather have this job than the job of getting that big bird in the air. In the same way, I'd much rather have the job of correcting someone who's trying to pray the Bible but has come up with some weird idea than someone who's not praying at all. And so, as I said a moment ago, I have enough confidence in the Word and in the Spirit that people would pray like this. Their prayers are going to be far more biblical than they ever would be without the Bible. Just making up their own prayers, and that's what people tend to do. And I guarantee you, 
And before long, you're going to pray amiss that way. In my first pastorate, we had a special prayer emphasis. And so one night we gathered at the home of a deacon to pray. And as we knelt to pray, he cried out, Oh, Lord, make us free in the spirit. I said, Amen. And then he said, And Lord, make us free in the flesh. I almost leaned over and hit him when he said that. Don't pray that, man. That's the problem around here. That's the way people pray without the Bible. And I guarantee you they're going to pray amiss if they pray without the Bible. But when people pray the Bible, their prayers are shaped by the words of the Bible, increasingly by the theology of the Bible, and their prayers becoming, become more and more conformed to the Bible when they pray the Bible. Would to God, I'd been taught to pray this way when I was young <clears throat> rather than just picking up phrases from people. <clears throat> because that's the way we learn to pray, isn't it? They're phrases that people use. They stick in our minds. We kind of string them together, and that becomes our prayer. But now you're delivered from that. And people who don't feel comfortable praying in front of others, even a small group of two or three, and I think it's often because they can't pray pretty prayers, like those who can pray the lead God and direct us, bless the gift and the giver, hide the pastor behind the shot of cross kind of prayers. They can't pray pretty prayers. Folks, you just pray something you find in the Bible. Nobody's going to get better than that. You don't have to pray some memorized phrases. Just open your Bible. Talk to God about what's there. No one's going to do better than that. I want to introduce at this point <clears throat> something that's not original with me, something called the Psalms of the Day. We're going to introduce a little math into your prayer life here. For those of you who just groaned, uh, hang on. <clears throat> so we have how many psalms? 150, generally 30 days in the month. That divides out five times. Or to put it another way, if you read five different psalms every day for a whole month, at the end of the month, you would have read the whole book of Psalms, all 150. Well, that's great. I know people who do that. That's not really what I'm advocating. What I'm suggesting is you take 30 seconds to quickly scan five Psalms and pick one. And that's the one you pray through for that day. So here's how this works. Let me illustrate it. I want you to imagine today is the 15th of the month. I know it's not, but I can't change this slide every time I do this, okay? So on the 15th of the month, what do you think the first psalm is you look at on the 15th of the month? 15, brilliant. You guys are going to get this. Whatever the day of the month is, that's the first psalm you look at. So on the 15th of the month, the first psalm you always look at is the 15th. Then to get the next one, you add 30. Where does 30 come from? 30 days in the month. So 30 more is 45. So you start with the day of the month. In this case, we're pretending it's the 15th. So the 15th Psalm is first. We add 30. 30 days in the month. Get the next one. It's Psalm 45. How many Psalms are we looking for? We're looking for five. So just keep it up. Add 30. 30 more is 75. 30 more is 105. 30 more is 135. So those five numbers in gold are the five Psalms of the day. Whenever the day of the month is, the fifteenth. Brilliant, you got it. Whether it's the fifteenth of August, the fifteenth of September, the fifteenth of October, the fifteenth of November, if it's the fifteenth of the month, you look at the fifteenth Psalm first, and then add thirty. All right, now here's the hard part. What do we do on the thirty-first? Well, my students usually give me smart aleck answers like take the day off or something like that. Psalm 119. Now, Psalm 119 is going to come up on the 29th, isn't it? Because on the 29th, what's the first psalm we look at? 29, because that's the day of the month. We add 30 is 59, 30 more is 89, 30 more is, here it is, 119, and 30 more is 149. But even if you use Psalm 119, on the 29th, you'll probably have plenty left over for the 31st. 
As you know, I'm a professor. So pop quiz class, what are the Psalms of the day today? Why 30? Today's the 30th. Great. What's next? 60. Why 60? You had 30. What, why 90? 30 more is 90. What's next? I know some of you hesitated. You go up to three digits, it gets a little tougher. But it's good for your math as well as your prayer life. And the last one is 150. So this is one of the easiest days to do it. 30, 60, 90, 120, 150. But if that was intimidating, if you're a math phobe, you said, I don't like this because it involves math, cheer up, technology comes to the rescue, you can let your brain rot and get this free app <laughs> that does it all for you. Brother in California who's an uh, app developer read my book on praying the Bible and saw a little chart in the back that I have for the Psalms of the day. It says, I can make an app out of that, so he did. So I keep it here on my homepage and... Um, You spell it out, F-I-V-E, there we go, uh, F-I-V-E, uh, Psalms, and so I keep it on the homepage there, and it opens up automatically to the Psalm of the day, Psalm 30, so here's the first one, and you just swipe 60, 90, 120, 150, you can even have it where it goes to the chapter of Proverbs for the day. So no math. And I find this, that the benefits are twofold. First of all, it gives you a place to go every day. Because some of you are thinking, why do I even want to use that? Here's the benefit. It, it gives you a place to go every day, and it helps you avoid this. Oh, yeah, I, I'm so sleepy today. We're going to try to pray through a psalm like I learned at the conference. All right. All right. I don't like that one. I used that one the other day. Oh, you're already going downhill, right? We need all the momentum we can get. We're already struggling, right? We need all the help we can get. This helps. Psalms of the day helps. It gives you a place to go every single day. You're not aimlessly thumbing through your Bible. It gives you a place to go. But it gives you variety because it actually gives you five places to choose from. That's the benefit of learning this or of using this, this free app. But it doesn't explain why the Psalms are the best place in Scripture from which to do this. So let me do that now. The Psalms were inspired by God for a specific purpose. All the books of the Bible are equally inspired, but the Psalms were inspired for a unique purpose. What was that? To be the songbook of Israel, right? So we get the Psalms from God. Well, duh, everybody knows that. But why did God give the Psalms? Unlike any other book of the Bible, God gave us the Psalms so that we would give the Psalms back to God. Right? He inspired the Psalms to be sung back to God. And I can tell you're overwhelmed. This is the technological highlight of the whole, whole thing. So let me run it past you again to make sure you don't get overwhelmed by the technology. We get the Psalms from God, right? Well, duh. But why did God give the Psalms? The purpose of him giving us the Psalms was for us to give the Psalms back to him in worship and praise. That's why I believe the Psalms are the best place in Scripture from which to pray Scripture. The best place in Scripture from which to pray Scripture. Martin Luther, I believe it was, said the Psalms are like a little Bible. Every doctrine in the Bible or in the Psalms, either in the bud or in the flower, but they're all there. 
And someone else has said there's a psalm for every sigh of the soul. You'll never go through anything in your life without being able to find the root emotion somewhere in the psalms. With 150 psalms, God not only inspired 150 psalms, he preserved 150 psalms for 3,000 years because they represent the entirety of the human experience. Whether you're exhilarated with God or you're angry at God or angry at enemies or anything in between, there's a psalm that reflects exactly where you are. And that's why if you'll spend just 30 seconds quickly scanning five psalms, it is uncanny how one of them will put into expression what's looking for expression in your heart, but you didn't even know it until you read it. That's why I almost never go anywhere but the psalms. But I think the second best place, though, to pray the Bible is in the New Testament letters. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and let me illustrate what it's like to pray through a New Testament letter. Now, a moment ago, I had you turn to Psalm 23 because I was confident you were all familiar with it. And so we didn't have to explain anything. It's easy to illustrate from a familiar passage. This time, I've intentionally chosen an unfamiliar passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If I had said, look at Romans 8 to learn how to pray through a New Testament letter. Well, you're familiar with Romans 8. If I said, let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. You know it's in 1 Corinthians 13 probably. And I would have picked two of the best known chapters in the New Testament. But in real life, when you tried this next week, it wouldn't be as easy because you wouldn't be as familiar. So I've intentionally picked an unfamiliar passage to try to demonstrate what it would be like on a real day. Not an ideal day like Romans 8, but on a real day. But it does raise the question, though, if the Psalms are the best place in Scripture from which to pray Scripture, what do you think would be the real-life reason that next Wednesday or next Thursday a person might find themselves wanting to pray from 1 Thessalonians 2? What do you think the real-life reason would be? Huh? That's exactly right. This, they're doing their daily Bible reading. And next Wednesday or Thursday, they're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And as they read it, they said, you know what? This really spoke to me today. I want to go back and pray through what I just read through. I don't have much time. I don't want to go to another book. I don't want to go over to the Psalms. I just want to stay right here. I want to go back and pray through what I just read through. But whatever the reason, if I were to do this today, it would look something like this. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. Oh, Lord, I pray that my coming to Oklahoma City would not be in vain. I don't want to waste their time. I don't want to waste my time. I pray that no one would walk out of here after this is over and saying, well, that was a waste of time. That was in vain. Let there be indeed much lasting fruit that comes from this 90 minutes together. When I can't think of anything else, I'd go to verse 2. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, now just stop right there. What two things stand out immediately? Suffered, mistreated. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're suffering. Maybe you've been mistreated. Or you immediately think of someone who is. Maybe, again, people who've been through the hurricane and their suffering comes to mind. Or you think of our persecuted brothers and sisters in the world, and you pray for them. Then you go on. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Oh, God, you might pray, give me the boldness to speak the gospel to that person down the street, that person at work, despite the conflict there's been between us. Or I pray for those persecuted believers to have the boldness to speak the gospel or the missionaries in those places, despite the conflicts with the government or false religions. Verse 3, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. And you think of someone who's coming under error. And you pray for God to deliver them from that. Or someone struggling with impurity. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your spouse or a child. 
or any attempt to deceive. And you think of a young woman being deceived by a young man or vice versa, and you pray for that person. Well, if you were to pray like this all the way through 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, how long do you think it would take you to pray through this chapter? A long time. But you wouldn't run out of anything to say, would you? And it would be unlike any prayer you ever prayed in your life, wouldn't it? But you didn't need any notes. You didn't have to remember anything. You didn't have to feel forced to struggle to come up with something. You just go through it line by line and talk to God about whatever comes to mind. And I think most of the time what's going to come to mind is something very close to the actual meaning of the text. But if it doesn't, as I said, whatever comes to mind, pray about it because you ought to pray about what it is that ever comes to mind anyway. But in reality, I think most of the time it will conform pretty closely with the meaning of of the text and can you think of any better way for someone to learn the text of the Bible learn the meaning of the Bible if they don't have any other resources just them and their Bible is there any better way to learn the true meaning of the Bible than to pray over it verse by verse it's so simple anybody can do that so the reason why the New Testament letters are I think the second best place in which to pray the Bible is you got so much compressed into such a small space there we saw even between the commas in verse 2, matter to pray about. Almost every verse in a New Testament letter is going to suggest something to pray about. And then one more illustration. Let's go to John chapter 5 and see what it's like to pray through a narrative passage. A narrative passage. What's in a narrative passage of Scripture? Story. Story. Well, this is the biggest part of our Bible, isn't it? All those Old Testament stories, most of the Gospels are narrative, a lot of the book of Acts is narrative. If we're going to pray the Bible, we have to know how to pray through a narrative. But folks, there's one big difference between praying through a narrative and what we have done thus far. Thus far, we've looked at the text microscopically. The Lord is my shepherd. I said one woman prayed 25 minutes over that. A moment ago, we saw between the commas, matter for prayer. But in a narrative passage, you have to back up. Instead of looking at it microscopically, you have to look at the big picture. And you pray about the big, broad brush strokes that are there. Because if you try to pray microscopically over a narrative passage, it could look like this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Well, if you had to come up with something, it might be about feasting or confess that you feasted too much. But it wouldn't be easy, would it? No, we're going to back up and get the big broad brush strokes that are here, the big ideas. You're probably going to look at all nine verses in this narrative and pray about the, the big ideas. And see, in a narrative passage, most of the time you have these stage setting verses after which comes the punchline. It may only be the punchline you'll pray about in a narrative not every little detail leading up to the punchline now any detail that prompts you to pray about something pray about it when you read here after this there's a feast of the jews maybe you have some church banquet coming up and you'd want to pray about that or whether or not you can have it or maybe you've got another important meal coming up in your business or in your own personal life and and you pray about that you ought to and it just pops into your head when you see the word feast that's fine. Most of the time, my guess is nothing is going to come to mind when you read after this, there was a feast of the Jews. But once having done this, I'm confident you can open up to any part of the Bible and do this. Well, now for the most important part of this whole thing. You are about to do this. As I'm talking, I want you to find the psalm, and I want this to be true for those watching the live stream as well as those in here with me. Find a psalm, doesn't have to be one of the psalms of the day, can be a favorite. Or just you're looking for an easy one, Psalm 25, Psalm 27, 139, just a, a favorite psalm, Psalm 23. I want everyone to do this. You can't share, so if you've got a Bible uh, on your phone, that's fine. I think we have some in the back. Is there anyone who needs a Bible? Raise your hand. I think we have some that were brought in. Okay, great. Uh, when I say go, I'm going to ask you to pray silently through the psalm. If you'd rather 
move to the side or somewhere to isolate yourself a little bit more, that's great. In just a few moments, I'll call us back together. If you're watching this on live stream, just stay within earshot of, uh, of uh, the television or computer. And when you hear my voice again, you'll know we've regathered and we're going to talk about this. So any questions? I'm asking each person to find a psalm and on their own, not with anyone else, pray silently through a psalm. And in a few moments, I'll call us back together. Okay? Ready? Break.
right. I hate to interrupt people when they're, when they're praying. But how did it go? Why was it good? Why? Brought things to mind I hadn't thought about, he said. Now, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands here. I'm not going to call on anybody, so don't be afraid to raise your hand. How many of you, as he did, prayed about some things you normally don't think to pray about? I see your hands. That's just about everybody I can see. You pray the Bible, God will bring things to mind you wouldn't have on a prayer list if prayer list were as big as the Oklahoma City phone directory. Oh, I'm sorry. Phone directory is a book they used to give us that had everybody's name and phone number in it and if you had a big city it was a big thick thing you just wouldn't think about it but God knows when something like that needs to happen again I was doing this in California one time and we had normally I do this on a Friday night in a church and Saturday morning we come back and talk about meditation and so we had this seven minute exercise like you just did came back the next morning and the lady said last night during that seven minute prayer exercise as I was praying a friend of mine from New York came to mind she said I moved from New York to California 10 years ago and in that 10 years I've had no contact with this old friend no phone call no email nothing for 10 years but she came to mind last night and I prayed for her and I got home last night and she called me it was 1 a.m. in New York <clears throat> 10 o'clock in California, but she called me. The Lord knows those kinds of things. Many of you have heard stories of people who were impressed that were awakened in the middle of the night to pray for a missionary on the other side of the world. Turns out their lives were in danger, maybe on the other side of the world. And the Lord can do that while you're praying the Bible. You'll pray about things you would never think to pray about. How many of you prayed about things you normally pray about but in brand new ways? Yeah, you're just going to pray about the same things that are very important to you, but the scriptures will inspire you to pray, guide you to pray about things you just, you wouldn't think to pray about them that way. Maybe you pray about your family every day, but you wouldn't pray about them that way. Excellent. Someone else, how'd it go? Seems short. That's good, isn't it? Seven minutes sometimes can be, it was only seven minutes, that felt like 70 minutes, but uh, it seemed short, and you could have kept going, couldn't you? Easily. Yeah. It wasn't boring. Wasn't boring. Hallelujah. It wasn't boring, because it's all fresh. Every verse, it's not the same old things you've always prayed. You pray about the same old things, but in brand new ways. And that's not boring because you love your family. You love all these things. You're vitally interested in these six things that we always pray about. You're vitally interested in them. And so if you pray about them differently every day, that interest remains. But if you say the same things every time, it's boring. If I said to you, who is the one person on the planet that if you had an hour-long conversation, you, you would choose. No limits. It can be a Christian. It can be some athlete. It can be some musician. It can be some world leader in some other scene, some writer. Who is it? And you told me, and I said, guess what? Good news. Tomorrow morning, right here, 8 o'clock, you get to have a one-hour conversation with that person. And you can hardly sleep tonight with anticipation. And you meet together tomorrow at 8 o'clock. It's everything you hoped it would be. And afterwards, I say, I've got more good news for you. Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock, you get to have another hour-long conversation with that person. But the only caveat is, on Tuesday morning, both of you have to say exactly the same things you said Monday morning. Well, I mean, you might pick up a few things, you know, on Tuesday morning you missed on Monday morning. But what if you had to have that same conversation every morning, every day for the rest of your natural life? How long would it be before you'd rather die than have that conversation again? Whereas tonight, you could hardly sleep. Well, folks, we can be talking to God himself. But if you say the same things every time, it's boring. But it's not boring when you both say different things, even though you talk about the same things. Someone else, I heard someone else speak. How'd it go? Yes. Okay, she said, made her look at the words in a different way. 
You know, what, what does this mean? Yeah, and it, it will bring other passages to mind, right? Other, it'll bring other scriptures to mind and really help you enter, engage with the Word of God. Uh huh. Yeah, she learned the you know the journalist questions: who, what, when, where, why, so forth. Yeah, all these things kind of come back, and other verses come to mind as you're praying over it slowly like that. Okay, <laughs> could have done a lot more. He picks Psalm one nineteen. Very good. Someone else, how'd it go? Someone farther back. How'd it go? It was mentioning about uh, the Holy Spirit. When, when you're praying through the Bible, something comes to mind like that. I, I think it was along the lines of a question. Can, is that the Holy Spirit guiding us to pray about the topic? Well, I mean, it's, it would not seem unusual, would it, that the author of the book speaks to us through the book like that, right? Calling our attention to certain things, bringing to mind certain people, certain things you normally wouldn't pray about. I, I think we can generally rely upon the fact that this is the Holy Spirit guiding us to pray here. Now, that's not infallible, but it is an experiential thing I think we, we expect when we come to the Bible, that we don't want to um, lose the fact that it is a book that's living, and the Holy Spirit is, is a person, and he speaks through the book that he has written. So it shouldn't be surprising that he would guide us in that kind of way. And maybe sometimes we look back and say, well, that, no, I don't think that was right. <laughs> maybe I missed it that time. But I, I think we want the, the, uh, the openness there that this is a part of God speaking. Because that, that leads me to one of the things that people usually say at this point, that it was more like a real conversation with a real person. Did you find it to be so? Yeah, people are saying it was more like a real conversation with a real person. Because that's what prayer is, isn't it? It is a real conversation with a real person. We're not imagining God saying these things away with that kind of mysticism. Because this is God speaking, isn't it? Amen. This is God speaking, isn't it? Yeah. Right. This is a Baptist church, isn't it, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is God speaking. And this is God speaking in verse 1, saying, He is your shepherd. And then like a real conversation with a real person... You return, you, you respond to that. Thank you, Lord, you are my shepherd. Shepherd my family. Shepherd me in this. And then, like a real conversation with a real person, what do you do when you've said what you want to say? You listen. You let the other person speak, right? And that's called, read verse 2. And that's God speaking in verse 2. And maybe like a real conversation with a real person, what the Lord says in verse 2 doesn't prompt a response from you, so... God continues speaking in verse 3 and verse 4 and verse 5, and then maybe you're ready to enter back into the conversation with something he says there in verse 5. God is willing to have this conversation with you as often as you want, as long as you want. And you don't have to bear the burden of the conversation. Don't you hate it when you're in that situation? You have to bear all the burden of the conversation? Husbands, protect your ribs here from... But we've all been there, right? I, I remember pastoring. People would visit our church, and, and I would talk to them on the phone or go visit them in person and say, well, I understand you visited our church Sunday. Yeah. It's like, good. Uh, glad you did. Uh, hope you enjoyed your time with us. Well, uh, good. Good. Um, well, I wonder if you have any questions for us, anything I, I can help you with or answer for you. No? Come on, man, help me out here, would you? Carry part of this conversation at least. Help me out here. That's the way we feel sometimes when we come to talk to God. Somehow we've gotten the idea we have to bear the entire burden 
of this conversation. And since we can't think of new things every single day, we default to saying the same old things about the same old things. And that's boring. When prayer is boring, you don't feel like praying, do you? You don't feel like praying, you tend not to pray. Again, you're delivered from that. God initiates the conversation every day, and all you have to do is respond. That's easy, isn't it? When you're tired, he initiates a conversation. When your mind is wandering, he initiates a conversation. All you have to do is respond. Anybody can do that. Anyone else? How'd it go? Did you find it was more God-centered more God-centered and less about, Lord, here I am again with what I want you to do for me. You still pray about the same things, as we said, your family, your future, finance, and so forth, but in a more God-centered way, in a less selfish way. He wants us to bring everything to him, but in a God-centered way. Anyone else? I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. She said she uses a method uh, to help remember to pray for th certain things on Monday, pray for our ministers and, and things like that. Tuesday, uh, those trouble and need. Wednesday, pray for Washington and things like that. that. That's great. And sometimes people will say to me, how does this intersect with a prayer list? Because if I don't have some technique like that, I forget to pray for important things. Well, I have used prayer lists sometimes and not used prayer lists sometimes. Most of the time, I just let the text suggest my prayer list. Because there's nothing that says I have to pray for people in Washington every week or every Wednesday or, or, or whatever. But if you find that you're not praying about certain things on a consistent basis, you, you can use a prayer list. Here's how you integrate them. You've got your Bible here and your prayer list here. So you read, the Lord is my shepherd. Who on my prayer list needs shepherding today? I shall not want who is in want. And that's how you can, you can integrate the two. Now, if you ever teach this to anyone else, and I certainly hope you do, there are two things you must do. And, and by the way, if you get my little book, Praying the Bible, I'm not here to sell books, but pretty much everything I've said is in that little book, so you'd have all the notes there. It's in Spanish uh, as well. But um, there's two things you must do. First and most importantly, give them a chance to try it right then. Not tomorrow. If you come back tomorrow. Not next week's class. They may not come back next week. Give them a chance to try it right then. Because if you don't, I know exactly what will happen. After it's over, they'll, they'll go out and say, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real good idea. I'll have to try that someday. And they never will. But when you give them a chance right then, that's when lives are changed. That's why no matter how short, how long, I give people a chance to try it. Usually it's not long, seven minutes, that's what you had. On campus, I give my students about 25 minutes, give them the chance to walk over the campus if they want and, and pray. I had five minutes once with junior high kids. I gave them 30 seconds to pray. <laughs> give them a chance to pray right then, not next time, but right then. Second thing is give them an opportunity for feedback, like we just did, to testify about the experience, because there's something about that fresh firsthand testimony from people they know <clears throat> That just does something that me droning on doesn't. So give them a chance to try it right then. That's most important. And then a chance to talk about it. So what have we learned here today? We've learned that when we pray, we tend to say the same old things about the same old things, right? The same old gray colorless prayers every time. Can we switch back to the uh, keynote? There we go. Let's say it's bless my family.
But now when you pray through Psalm 23, it comes out as, Lord, shepherd my family. And there's something about that shepherding imagery that just transforms the prayer. In one sense, it's the same prayer, isn't it? Bless my family. But when you pray, bless my family, through Psalm 23, it comes out as shepherd my family. The next day, you may pray that through 1 Corinthians 13, that they would show 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. The next day, you may pray that they would uh, become meditators on the Word of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing to pray for someone? But would you ever in your life pray that if you weren't praying through Psalm 1? The next day you might pray that they would manifest the fruit of the Spirit. The next day you might pray they would sense the presence of God wherever they go. Do you see it's the same prayer every single day, really? Bless my family. But when you pray, bless my family, through a different passage, it comes out a different prayer. And that's where that's why you don't lose interest in praying this because you love your family and you want to pray about them as often as you can if you say the same old things though even that's going to be boring but because you love them if you say it in a fresh way every day it doesn't get boring but with this method you don't have to think up a fresh way to say it every day who has the time for that who has the the mental energy for that nobody but you don't have to all you have to do is open your bible And talk to God about your family with what you see there. And that's easy. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. The one who knows the Bible best, the one who knows the Bible least. The most spiritually mature in the church, the least spiritually mature in the church. Anyone can do this. If you led someone to Christ this afternoon and brought them to this now, and they'd never been in church one minute in their life. They'd never read one verse in the Bible in their life. They could do this today. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, um, Lord, please shepherd me as I grow as a Christian. He got it, right? He got it. Now, he's going to skip over a lot more verses than you will, but he can do it. And as he grows and matures, his prayers are going to become more and more shaped by the Bible. Anybody can do this. Anybody can do this. I'm so glad to see young people back here. You can do this. Anybody can do this. So easy. Now, how do you do this with a group? Well, sorry, I really don't have time to tell you. Uh, This group can be with a family. It can be with a small group. It can be a church-wide prayer meeting. And basically... There's in one of the uh, uh, appendices in the little book, it's a few pages on this. But basically, I call these good, better, and best. Now, one method is just, if, if this is my group, okay, you take the first verse, you take the second verse, you take the third verse, and let's pray. And it's going great till we get to her verse. And her verse is one of the imprecatory psalms. You know, oh, Lord, dash your children's heads against their rock, and smash their teeth in their mouth. and Maybe you pray that for OSU or OU, depending on which side you're on, you know. You know, she, she just has a brain freeze. I don't even know what this means, much less what to do with it. So it can work, but it can backfire. Next way is just have people read the passage and then just pray aloud based on a verse that impresses them. But I think the third one's probably the best way. And that's if you're the prayer leader, you read the psalm out loud, then you go back and say, all right, we're going to pray, folks. And as we pray, maybe we've already taken prayer requests, I'm just going to call out, just throw out a, ver- a phrase at a time, phrase from that psalm and i'm just going to call out the easy ones i'm not going to call out you know lord dash your children's heads against the rock and things people would know what to say i'm going to throw out easy things that anybody could probably pray from so i'll say let's pray and then i'll say the lord is my shepherd and see who picks up on that and maybe lord Lord, please shepherd joe to get a job lord please shepherd mary she has surgery tomorrow and then when nothing else comes to mind i throw out a shall not want And people pray from that phrase. And I'm going to skip hard phrases and just throw out the easy phrases from that psalm that would prompt people to pray according to the psalm. There may be other ways you can think of, but you can do this with a group. I require my students once during uh, during the semester to read the biography of George Mueller. Usually at the beginning of the semester, a third of them don't know who he is. By the end of the semester, they're buying extra copies to give away as gifts. George Mueller is widely considered maybe the greatest man of prayer and faith since the times of the New Testament. 
He lived nearly the entirety of the 1800s, most of that in Bristol, England. In his day, he had four internationally known ministries. Today, he's best known for one, his orphanage. When he started his orphanage in a time in Dickensian, England, there were actually more children under age seven in prison than in orphanages. One reason was there were hardly any orphanages. But a second reason was if you were an orphan in those days, you were Oliver Twist. You were just a street urchin. There was high mortality in those days in the cities in particular, and some seven-year-old might come home for supper, and the doors are boarded up. The parents are gone. They're dead. Terrible disease conditions in the city, and all this seven-year-old has is what's on his back, and he doesn't know anybody, really. Well, after a while, he's going to be hungry. And so what's he going to do? Hmm? He's going to steal. And pretty soon he's going to figure out it's advantageous to band together with other kids who are stealing, and thus you have Oliver Twist. And they would hide and then attack people, these women coming from the grocery store and the market, and people, they would barge into people's houses and steal food, and people demanded something be done by these roving bands of hungry orphans. And so the police would round them up and put them in prison. There was no place to put them. George Mueller started an orphanage. And over time, he fed, clothed, housed, and educated 10,000 of them, over 1,500 at a time, as many as 1,500, 2,000 at a time. And he did it for decades. And he never made his needs known to anyone except to God in prayer. And by implication in his annual reports. At the end of every year, he'd put out an annual report to those who had donated to the ministry. And he'd say, on June 15th, we had no money to feed 2,000 orphans. We prayed, here's our God provided. August 27th, we had no money to pay the staff. We prayed, here's our God provided. So people knew that his ministry survived by voluntary gifts. But he never asked for money. He never made needs known. And God funneled over half a billion dollars in today's money through his hands. He had over 50 thousand specific recorded answers to prayer in his journals over 30,000 of which he said were answered the same day or same hour that he prayed them that's something like five specific answers to prayer every day for 60 years if I had five specific answers to prayers every day for one week that'd be the greatest week of my life this is every day for 60 years. To read his biography is like reading another chapter in the book of Acts. But George Mueller said that for 10 years, 10 years into this, what he called his life of faith, his habit was after getting dressed in the morning, he would pray until breakfast. And sometimes it would take him half an hour to an hour before he got into the spirit of prayer we might say, before he felt like praying. So he'd try to pray, and he'd try to pray, and his mind would wander, his heart would be cold, he'd come back, he'd keep trying, keep trying. Finally, after half an hour, an hour, he would begin to feel like praying, and only then, he said, did he begin to pray. What do we do? Five minutes, seven minutes, our mind wanders half the time, but George Mueller would stay with it till he felt like praying. And that's the way it was, he said, for 10 years, until he made one slight alteration in his prayer life. And what do you think it was? What you just did. He started praying the Bible. And the greatest man of prayer and faith since the New Testament said, once I started that, I scarcely ever suffered as I did before. And a hero to so many of us in the ministry, Charles Spurgeon, that great British Baptist preacher of the mid-1800s, a supporter of George Mueller's, said somewhere, we ought to pray when we feel like it. Well, I've been saying for the last hour and a half, we don't pray because we don't feel like it. But Spurgeon said, we should pray when we feel like it because it would be terrible to miss such an opportunity. And he went on to say, and we should pray when we don't feel like it because it would be terrible to remain in such a condition. Why can't I think of cool things like that? <laughs> this the reality is you get up in the morning, let's say 7 o'clock, you go to pray, you don't feel like praying, cheer up. You're normal. You know why you don't feel like praying? You're sleepy. 
You've been dead to the world for the last six or seven hours. We don't wake up with our hearts just instantly on fire for the things of God. I run into door frames when I get up in the morning. But the good news is you are not subject to those feelings. God said to Jeremiah, is not my word like a hammer and a fire? It's like a hammer that breaks hard hearts. It's like a fire that melts cold hearts. God says his word is like a fire. You wake up at 7 o'clock, you don't feel like praying, cheer up, you're normal. But the good news is you can take the fire of God's word and plunge it into your cold heart so that by 7.02, just like by 4.32 today, you begin to feel like praying. And having done this almost every day of my life since the 1st of March, 1985, I can testify there is nothing in all my devotional life that more quickly and consistently kindles my consistently cold heart in prayer like praying the Bible. I almost never feel like praying when I go to pray. But God's Word does its work. Now, in closing, I want to ask you to look at Acts chapter 4 while I tell you about these other two. Go to Acts chapter 4 while I tell you about these other two. There are passages about Jesus on the cross. And as you know, Jesus said seven brief things on the cross. Brief because he had been beaten nearly to death. Brief because he was so thoroughly dehydrated. Brief because his entire body weight is sagging on those three spikes. And to get enough breath in his diaphragm to speak, he had to push up on that spike in his feet, and all of his weight was on that one spike, and that was so horrifically painful. They would speak only very briefly and then sink back down. But the longest of the seven brief things Jesus said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's the first verse of, Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 is prophetic about what? The crucifixion. There are more details about the bodily aspects of crucifixion in Psalm 22 than our four Gospels put together. Two of the four Gospels simply say they took him and crucified him, and they go on. But in Psalm 22, we read things like this, My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Well, indeed, Jesus said, I thirst. I can count all my bones, Psalm 22 says. How do we know that? Because the Romans crucified their victims unclothed. All my bones are out of joint. When they would drop them in place on the cross, often it just yanked their bones out of the joint because of the, uh, the jolt of it. There are two multi-sentence statements, prophesied in Psalm 22, repeated verbatim at the foot of the cross. I am convinced that when Jesus sank back down, he continued praying through Psalm 22. Now, to some degree, that's speculation. But we know this. We know he prayed the first verse. And we know why he spoke briefly. And since he was literally fulfilling Psalm 22 at that moment, I think it makes perfect sense that when he sank back down, he continued praying through Psalm 22. And that's further supported by the fact that at the very end, in Luke 23, at the very end, the last thing he said was, Into your hands I commit my spirit. From Psalm 32 or 31. What's the point of all that? Jesus prayed the Psalms. The last thing he said on earth was praying a psalm. Then in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, Peter and John had been arrested. They'd been threatened. They'd been, when they were released, verse 23 says, they went to their friends, they went back to the church, and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Many scholars believe actually that is a quotation. You know where it's from? Psalm 146. But whether it is or not, go on. Verse 25, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The second half of verse 25, all of verse 26 is from where? Psalm 2. 
This is a place that says, and after they prayed, the place was shaken. What's the point? The early church prayed the songs. George Mueller, maybe the greatest man of prayer and faith since the early church, prayed the songs. Jesus prayed the songs. Why not you? And it's so easy. Let's pray now. O oh Lord, in the Psalms it says, O oh you who hear prayer, to you all men come. We come to you asking the question that the disciples asked. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like George Mueller did. Teach us to pray like the disciples did. Teach us to pray like you did on the cross. Teach us to pray. And I ask this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Thank you guys for being here this afternoon. And to those that have joined online, I'm going to show our appreciation uh, to Dr. Whitney. Uh, we'll, you can clap and do that now. And then if you get a chance, you can tell him how much you appreciate him on the way out the door. So thank you again for being here. Uh, if you happen to be a parent of a teenager that's going to stay for the parent link, uh, you guys, that will start in, in here in about 20 minutes or 25 minutes or so. For the rest of you guys are dismissed. Dr. Whitney will be down here front maybe for a brief, and then we're going to feed him some dinner to re-energize him for one more hour. So thanks for being here.